Hello, this is Ray Flannery, the Assistant Director for Student Organizations. And hi, I'm Jill Finch. I'm the Coordinator in Student Involvement. Today we're going to be talking you through the Student Organization Workshop content. We're also missing another team member, but Dustin Lewis is our Senior Associate Director of uh, Student Involvement, and um, he is also um, able to answer any questions you might have after this presentation. So let's jump right in. Since you last saw our office, we've potentially grown a bit. Um, if you haven't seen our growing team of faces up in the Gallagher Student Center, feel free to come by and visit any one of us. Uh, we've added several new positions this year, which we're really excited about um, to support students and their efforts. Um, many of these faces are um, excited to introduce new programming for students and new leadership opportunities as well. Uh, we're really excited to support the many endeavors that you have throughout the year. Come up and check us out and say hello. While our work and staff may have grown, our mission still remains the same to you all as the students. We believe that through involvement, individuals discover their passions and develop their strengths to lead a purposeful life. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we have several different, um, I guess, components of our work across campus. We manage orientation programs like Manresa every August. We have campus activities sprinkled throughout the year clubs and organizations that is most pertinent to this presentation. We also manage space within the Gallagher Student Center. We have many leadership programs. We have commuter services, including the commuter lounge on the third floor of the Gallagher Student Center. We also have a hand in off-campus living, event policies, which you'll get a glimpse of in this presentation, and student government. Something else I'll note here is that some of these um, programs have expanded. And since our team has expanded too, we've had to shuffle some spaces around. So you might see student government moving into a new workspace next to our office, which was previously held as the Student Organization Resource Room. Resource supplies can now be found in the makerspace of the library, which is exciting and has lots of new possibilities for student groups as well. We want to set the standard for being a student organization that is strong and active on campus through this presentation. What do we mean when we say this? Well, we want an active presence with robust events, not just meetings with food, but rather recurring meetings that are highly engaging and memorable for members. We also expect that as leaders, you'll be responsive and communicative to our office staff. We have lots of messages coming your way throughout the year um, via email and EngageXU to talk about upcoming deadlines, invitations to programs, sponsorships and collaborations, and more. So please be sure to be checking your email regularly and communicating both with us and your members when we ask you to. Along these same lines, we ask that you engage in members um, and ask them what they would like to see out of your club too, right? The clubs that you are representing have more than just a leadership in their body. And so uh, we want to make sure that all the members are having some level of input in the programming and opportunities that they are afforded. Uh, we also don't expect you to only be strictly business, right? Your group is also serving as an opportunity for socialization. So you can do some team bonding activities and that's an appropriate use of your funding too. Be sure to not just make it all business all the time. And finally, we expect that you're future-minded too. Whether you're assuming an officer role for the first time or a seasoned veteran, we want you to be thinking about whoever will take your place eventually. How can you make their transition easier than the one you had? In terms of officer development, here are just a few roles that you might wish to have on your board and might be representing this role as you watch this video. For instance, presidents, are typically the point person for our office when it comes to all things regarding communication and accountability. You're the person who is the go-to, um, you're our office's most valuable contact when it comes to getting a pulse on your club and its successes and challenges. The university relies on you as the president to be mission-centered, mission-driven, know your club's mission and purpose, and speak on behalf of your group. Then we have a vice president role. This may look different depending on the club type that you are, but in general, we make the recommendation that vice presidents should really support the president and be ready to assume that role 
and maybe also tackle the engagement and recruitment piece of the puzzle as well. So vice presidents can sort of shoulder the responsibility of looking forward and figuring out who might want to assume leadership roles next and how the club has strategy about where they are going. And finally, treasurers are an important piece of the puzzle too. This is not an exhaustive list of leadership roles, and you can have multiple officers in the same position, but treasurers are our primary contact when it comes to all things financial. That doesn't mean this person is singularly making the financial decisions on behalf of the club, but it does mean that this person is responsible for directing the spending and making sure to keep a pulse on where the money is going, how the money has been earmarked, things like that. Also goal setting to make sure that the financial obligations to the university and the members of the group are being met. And then the role of the advisor. We ask students to have a very active relationship with their advisors. Whether advisors are overseeing multiple clubs or one, new to advising or returning to their role, we ask that you have a recurring meeting time with them to really establish some ground rules and have engagement on a regular basis. This is also a check and balance between both ends to make sure that there's a university responsibility within the picture of what every club is planning and operating. We also ask that advisors have an active role in the picture, but don't overstep their role to become a micromanager. There are many times that an advisor will be needed to um, ad approve an event for our processes, but that doesn't mean that the advisor is calling the shots. Advisors, for instance, can't spend club funding without advice and um, permission from the club leadership. And so therefore, advisors only have a limited capability to operate on behalf of your club. This relationship might look different for each club and advisor, but for some more active groups on campus that might be doing travel, um, chaperoning is one way that an advisor could support the club and its opportunities. However, that doesn't mean that the advisor is the only person that can chaperone a trip, for instance. Advisors are the first line of contact for students, as well as our office, but student involvement and our team are really meant to serve as a backup channel so that when the advisor notices that things aren't coming in, in time or maybe you as the student leader are seeing a stalling of progress on your end, um, you can come chat with us if your advisor is unresponsive. start covering the world of finances. So as you can see on this slide, it explains everything we're going to cover. So with the student activity fee, it's good for all of you just to understand that every undergraduate student contributes $115 per semester if you're full-time and $12 per credit if you're part-time. And this contributes to what student government funds you for the entire year. And then every organization has a fund number. It is a unique six digit number beginning with 81. And in order to find this, you can go to your group, to your settings under more, and that's where your student org fund number is. A couple of other options if you do need it, you can email Ray and I, we can let you know what it is. And in the front of our office on the blue table, there is a little cheat sheet with all of the fund numbers. And we also recommend to take photos of this or keep it in your phone. That way you have it, you do need this for every single financial form that you submit through our office. Another feature that all of you have is the accounting book, and this is also under the group page, and it's a, it says accounting book. And with this, you can see your current balance, and you can also see archive um, accounting books from previous years to know what your club has spent. So one thing I just want to say with all of these new updated spending and purchasing rules is this, there are no exceptions to this and these are going to be strictly enforced throughout the year. Um, so student orgs have to submit all purchasing requests at least two weeks in advance. The university's finance department reviews all purchasing requisitions over $500 once a week. So anything that I would have to enter into Xavier Buy. So an example of this would be if your club needs to order apparel and say that costs $600, you would definitely need to get that two weeks in advance if not even earlier because they only review and approve once a week. Um, a big one this year, there's no reimbursements for purchases made from individual personal Amazon accounts. We have a Xavier Business Amazon account, and that's what we need to use. And then another rule we have with gift cards for event prizes, individual gift cards have to be $50 or less, 
and the total amount for a program is $500 or less. With thank you gifts, this is going to be a little new for some groups this year. Um, you cannot purchase advisor thank you gifts or gifts for other university employees with student org funds. If you want to go ahead and get your advisor a gift at the end of the year, that is fine, but you just have to do so with your own personal money. Um, for student thank you gifts, including those for graduating seniors or officers, those should not exceed a total of $25 per person. Student orgs cannot purchase regalia such as honor cords or stoles for graduating seniors with student org funds. Um, if you need to do this, you just need to purchase your own regalia through the bookstore. Um, unless you're a chapter of a national organization that vends their own licensed regalia, and if you are, you can just come and talk to Ray and I, and we can help you with that process. So with apparel, this is also going to be a new one for this year. Um, you can spend a maximum of $35 per individual student. Beyond $35, students have to contribute to the purchase. So, for example, if you are going to buy a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, and sweatpants for your club, and it's $40, you all have to contribute the extra $5 um, with your own personal money. And we'll get to this later, but purchases have to be made through one of three companies. Um, and then another new one for this year, no equipment can be purchased or reimbursed. And this includes speaker systems, software, digital cameras, lighting systems, sporting equipment, or outdoor furnishings. We've just had too many clubs previous years that will buy big equipment like that, and then it tends to walk off with the club. They have nowhere to store it, and then newer club officers every year keep wanting to buy the same things over and over again, and it's just not a great use for club funds. So with deliveries and pickup, any items that were ordered through the purchase form that need to be picked up from our office have to be picked up within 48 hours of receiving an email from me. Um, and then another new one, PCAR requests have to be made two weeks in advance. Um, you can use the PCAR, but you have to request it through the purchase form. And it's good to know the PCAR cannot be taken out of OSI. There's only one available for student org use. All of this information on spending and purchasing is on this website um, below, xavier.edu slash org spending. It is a very important website for everyone to have and note. <coughs> so we're going to cover the different forms now that you all would fill out in the world of finance. So the first one, the student payment advance form, has not changed much at all from last year. Organizations can take out one advance at a time, up to $300 in total, and you can receive a Focus Blue card. The individual that's listed on the advance is the one responsible for it. So for example, if you are the president of your club and you sign out in advance, and you give the advance and the Focus Blue card to your VP, your VP loses the receipts and loses the Focus Blue card, it is the president that is on the hook for that money and that amount of money will be charged to your Bursar account. Um, we will only give advances to groups that have fully approved events in EngageXU. Um, the Focus Blue card is very similar to a Visa gift card. It's used to purchase goods at point of sale. So you can purchase items at Kroger, Walmart, Target, stores like that. You cannot pay performers or individuals for service or use a Focus Blue for rentals. And we just ask that you return the receipts with the Focus Blue card back to the Bursar's office in the mezzanine within seven days. If you don't, they will charge your Bursar account. So the pre-spend authorization form is for any individuals who wish to spend more than $300 of their own personal money and expect to be reimbursed. If you don't submit this and have this approved before you ask for a reimbursement for something more than $300, you will not be reimbursed. The reason we have this form in place is there's a good chance that if you are willing to spend $300 of your own personal money, there's a good chance that we will be able to use our university purchasing card or figure out a different way, maybe through the purchase form, to take care of this purchase rather than you having to spend your own money. Um, and then with this, you just have to know that your advice, this also counts for advisors too. They also, if they are gonna spend 300 or more of their own personal money, they also have to have this submitted and approved. And then with student reimbursement form, um, students can be reimbursed by Zelle for eligible purchases made up to $300. Once again, Amazon's not eligible. Anything over $300 can be reimbursed if the pre-spend authorization was approved in advance. 
you just have to upload copies of your receipts and we do recommend with receipts you can take photos and submit those that's totally fine if you have any missing receipts those will not be reimbursed and we don't reimburse for tax exempt there's a copy of our tax exempt form online and um, just a reminder students and advisors will not be reimbursed for any apparel purchases also on top of Amazon purchases advisors are also reimbursed using this form um, the only difference with this is the president and vice president are the two approvers for the advisor to be reimbursed. And then the purchase form is the last of the forms. This has to be completed two weeks in advance. And this is when you use this to order items from Amazon or office supplies from Brown Enterprise Solutions. Or you can use it to request a P card or this can be used to pay different vendors. With vendors, you have to have a quote or a contract. We'll get to this later, but you as students and your advisors cannot sign any contracts on behalf of the university that has to go through our office. Um, and you cannot use this form to hire students, students that are being hired for DJ services, graphic design, photography, those have to be set up through student employment payroll and Ray can help you with that. All right, now we're gonna shift gears a bit here and talk about what you can't do with your money. Uh, so for instance, some uh, examples of this could include donating funds and scholarships. Student activity fee dollars are reserved for programming and activities that your club might do and therefore cannot be just put towards charitable organization or donation. Uh, these funds are um, used to support these types of events, but we can't exclusively have you cutting a check to a charitable group um, since Xavier itself is a nonprofit organization. Groups interested in donating funds need to fundraise for those dollars on their own accord and come up with that money in a separate pool on their EngageXU accounting book and then take that money and make a donation on their club's behalf. Treasurers for their respective groups are responsible for noting what balance is reserved for what purpose if they choose to do any kind of fundraising and this goes the same for scholarships as well. Scholarships must be fundraised and they can't just simply be given out from your club budget that you were allocated. This is something that might come into play more during March gladness and we're happy to talk more at that time in the spring about what this might entail for your group. We'll also talk about some things that are big no-nos for students here, one of which being contracts. If you are <laughs> contracting anyone to be part of your event, we ask that students do not sign the forms. Our office will take on that liability ourselves. You're welcome to bring forth a, con uh, a contract to us about something like a performer or a vendor, uh, but we want to make sure that everything is legally appropriate and that students aren't on the hook for something that we cannot promise or guarantee as an institution. Contracts should be submitted using the student organization purchase form and are subject to the same review as all the other forms um, to be entered into Xavier by for payment approval and pre-authorization. Professional services like, for instance, equipment rental or animal um, encounters have to have some additional safeguards in place, such as a certificate of insurance on file with the risk management office prior to having us sign those contracts. So that's why we want those in as soon as possible to give you as much lead time as we can uh, to ensure that everything is compliant and your event can take place. Performers and speakers entering into contracts should follow the performance agreement form or an independent contractor form with the university. These can also be found on EngageXU, and depending on the price point of those engagements, they may be subject to additional review. Again, the sooner the better when you can get these in for us so we can expedite that review process. And when in doubt, make sure you ask us. Um, give us plenty of time and we want to assist you. Contract review can unfortunately take quite a bit of time and we don't want you to be stuck waiting. Um, and so there's only so much we can do on our end to make this process go faster. Uh, so we just ask for you to be as proactive as possible. And that goes for all things too, but especially something like a major event or large contract. This is a quick overview of the remainder of this presentation. We will touch on a few subjects that might be pertinent to your group and its activities throughout the year. Um, keep in mind that these are also accessible on our website and you can definitely visit more in-depth policy and read through them yourself at a later time. But we'll be hitting on the highlights here for you so that you get a general overview of some of the do's and don'ts for running your club. 
For instance, submitting events in EngageXU is an expectation, whether it's an event, a meeting, um, any type of meetup or engagement whatsoever needs to be represented as an event on Engage. When submitting this, you'll complete a form and then your advisor will approve that before our office gives final approval. We reserve the right to reject events if they are not submitted within a timely fashion. This year, we're asking for at least two weeks notice, otherwise your event will be rejected. When you are filling out this form, please be sure to give as much detail as you can, even if it's not all confirmed yet, just so we get the best sense of what your plans are for the event. In the event that you need to change something before your event takes place, let us know and we can sort of force some edits on our end rather than having the event get edited and then suddenly removed from the EngageXU platform just before your event takes place. We also ask that clubs be tracking their attendance at all events on EngageXU. There are several ways for you to do this, one of which being using the QR codes. This seems to be the most popular among students. It's very seamless. You know, everyone has their smartphone on them almost all the time. And so this is often a quick way to capture how many members were at your meeting or event. And it's a good way to keep track of that data both for yourselves as well as our office. If for some reason you prefer paper and pencil or you have to switch to a backup plan, just make sure that you're entering that data after the event takes place so that we have accurate numbers for your groups. This is an expectation that is not new, but it is really important, maybe now more than ever, as we look at the numbers and help you analyze what you could do better to boost your membership. In terms of reserving space on campus, the EngageXU event form allows you to book two sets of spaces um, directly. Those are mainly outdoor space on the Xavier Yard and Academic Mall or the Justice Atrium above the cafeteria. However, there's also other opportunities to book space, but you'll have to go through different channels to do so. For instance, if you look to use a classroom, you'll have to email the registrar's office directly and you can find their email here. If you wanna use space in the Gallagher Student Center, that can be done on a third-party platform known as Mazevo, or speak to the front desk staff at Gallagher and they can help you assess availability. If you want to use any space in the hub, please contact their team directly over at Rec Sports, or if you want to, you can look at the contact guide on our website and that can direct you on who to email directly. And finally, Cintas, just as a, another example, has their own team of staff that can help you plan for your event and get the spaces booked. Be mindful that whichever space you choose has to accommodate the number of bodies that you're bringing into the room, as well as acknowledging that there might be a cost associated with different space. So be sure to budget for that and plan ahead. If you're looking to bring a food truck to campus, there's also some other special protocols you have to follow. We're very fortunate that our catering, part well, catering partner, Chartwells, excuse me, is willing to allow student groups to bring food trucks to campus. However, the expectation from students on this is that if they're walking up to a food truck, they will be receiving food uh, for free. And so with this in mind, your club would have to subsidize the cost of the food truck's presence on campus. From experience, our office knows that food trucks book out very far in advance and they're very popular. So be sure to plan this out well in advance if you do tend to go this route, um, especially because we also have to make sure that they too provide a certificate of insurance and that they are cleared by the county uh, for the Board of Health to serve food on our campus. If you anticipate doing this, please just let us know. Um, you'll have to do so formally, but come chat with us if you're not sure or need some ideas. We have a large Rolodex of contacts regarding food trucks, and we work with a lot of different vendors. We can help steer you in the right direction if you give us enough notice. Fundraising. We touched on this a bit during the financial portion of the presentation, but it's important to go a little deeper here too. So for instance, student organizations are required to register all types of fundraising activities, whether this is direct sale to members of something like t-shirts or other apparel, collection of money from those outside of Xavier, uh, collecting dues through your membership, and even working to collect like specific items for charity, um, such as maybe some coats for kids or toys for tots. Whether you're doing any of those, you'll need to make sure you indicate that that is the type of event on EngageXU. 
Student groups are prohibited from selling homemade baked goods on campus or off campus to generate funds for their groups. Uh, you're welcome to purchase uh, like items from a local bakery or um, you know prepackaged goods, but they have to be either prepared in a commercial kitchen or prepackaged individually. Um, this is to also ensure compliance with things like allergens and health department standards. Um, and we really want to make sure that we are upfront about this so that we don't have to shut down any events that are maybe for a good cause, but not in compliance with our policy. And then, of course, when fundraising, we ask that you as the student leaders take the responsibility of reaching out to any building hosts that might be, um, you know, sponsoring this event or allowing you to have a collection bin in their region um, to make sure that they know that the event is taking place and that anything is clearly marked as to when the event is taking place, what the funding or items are being reserved for. And if you're unsure about any of this, please just let us know. Uh, we've dealt with this in the past for a lot of different groups, and we have some helpful tips that might be beneficial to you. Our student invited speaker policy has changed a bit too. Um, so be sure to, that if you do plan to bring a speaker to campus, that's someone external to Xavier, even alumni fall under this policy. If they are speaking to your group, you'll have to get approval with no less than two weeks um, before the event. So in other words, getting us this information sooner rather than later allows us to review your plan for the event. Depending on the level of um, popularity of the speaker, potential controversy, Xavier needs to be able to prepare accordingly on how to respond and manage your event. Uh, Xavier reserves the right to deny events. They may not deny them solely based on controversial nature, but the university does have that authority. So please be mindful of this, whether you're bringing a speaker to speak to your members, speak to the general campus, or even meet with you virtually, this does fall under this policy. Again, just be sure to do everything by the book here to avoid landing in hot water. Something to note is that if your advisor is looking to use their academic freedom because they might be a tenured faculty member, that does not apply inherently in the same way that it does during their class. And so therefore, um, they cannot just bring in a colleague from another institution, for instance, to speak to your club. That still has to get pre-approval from our office. Likewise, political activities have gone under some revisions as well when we look at policy here, so we want to be very crystal clear about what we can and can't have on campus this year. Due to the university's designation with the Internal Revenue Service, the university is limited in its ability to participate in political campaigns. Um, student organizations are more than welcome to do things like lobbying or even voter registration drives, but something to note is that any type of voter registration that's happening on campus must be done in a nonpartisan manner, meaning no promotion of any political party or candidate can take place even passively through merchandise or apparel. Uh, the university cannot be seen as endorsing any political candidate or party, so we don't allow any kind of yard signage or anything like that to take place on shared real estate on campus. Um, if you are planning a political event, please check out our page on our website. Um, but also be sure to uh, submit this again on EngageXU ahead of time. We have this magic, you know, two-week timeline that is popping up for many things. Please be sure to plan ahead so that you don't, again, run into issues. When we look at events where alcohol might be present, um, this is acceptable in our policies, but there's several more safeguards you have to consider. So if you're having an event where alcohol will be present, you'll have to follow the alcohol and other drugs policy. These events, once again, should be submitted in advance and are subject to the review of our Senior Director for Student Involvement and Student Affairs. Um, and so, therefore, you'll have to meet with our director to go over some expectations and policy. Primary considerations for alcohol approval include things like whether the majority of attendees are over the legal drinking age of 21, uh, the presence of an advisor and or chaperones, the presence of transportation to and from a venue if the event is taking place off campus, and more. Additionally, if the event is on campus proper, you must utilize our campus catering partner, Chartwells, since they hold the university liquor license. You'll also have to make sure you have security present, so this event might end up more costly than you initially anticipate. Please be mindful of this in case you do want to have an event where alcohol is served. 
we also have to make some stipulations about motion picture copyright law. Once again, we don't want you getting into hot water with any major corporations or making Xavier um, into a bad position here. So copyright law prohibits student organizations from simply screening a feature film or documentary without licensing the film or title first. There are educational exemptions for your professors or advisors, but that doesn't pertain when it's in their capacity as your club. Therefore, you'll have to kind of go through some extra channels. You can't bypass these. Um, you'll have to kind of license the film and pay a cost to do so. The only workarounds to this are through Netflix original documentaries or Canopy, which is the university's library streaming platform. If you find a title on either of these streaming, then you're able to show that without prior consent. However, any other titles that you wish to bring to campus have to be licensed appropriately. We've used two different companies to do this in the past, but we will warn you that this might come at a cost of several hundred dollars, uh, depending on the popularity of the movie, depending on the recency of its release. So please prepare in advance if you do want to have a movie night on campus, for instance. Brand use, promotional material, and apparel. For all apparel promotional items, these are subject to the review of our marketing and communications department, and therefore the designs must be pre-submitted. Student organizations, for instance, can only use two separate logos, one with the plain Xavier X, and one can be created with your club name side by side if you wish. Uh, we have to make a note here that D'Artagnan, the blue blob, and the sword are limited only to athletic use. Clubs and student organizations are not authorized to use those, unfortunately, at this time. The university also limits the vendors that can be used to purchase apparel. We have three separate vendors that you're welcome to purchase through, but you cannot simply jump on customink.com and create a design of your own. That will not be approved for purchase, and you cannot use club funding to support that. Unfortunately, at this time, new vendors are not being licensed, so you should work with one of our existing partners to do so if you wish to make any kind of apparel. And going back to what Jill mentioned a little earlier in the presentation, be sure to be um, following our thresholds for funding for these types of apparel purchases and making sure that your members are paying into that if you're exceeding those budget targets. And then in terms of student domestic travel, we want to make sure that we're really clear on what this means. If you're looking to take members off campus, a trip or travel is defined as more than 35 miles from campus or overnight stay at any location that's not campus. Student travel um, must be submitted at least three weeks in advance, and this is to ensure that you have also taken the time to book any necessary accommodations for your travel and created a roster of members traveling with you. You'll need to make sure that that roster is submitted at least 48 hours in advance of departing campus. Trip coordinators are responsible for making sure that any and all forms are completed and on file with Flynn Hall and the Risk Management Office on campus. You will also need to submit a detailed itinerary for what you plan to do on your trip. Purchases associated with this travel will only be approved for payment once the itinerary has been submitted and approved. Trip organizers should know that COVID protocols are still in place regarding health and safety, and if you're unsure about what this means, please visit the student travel website to learn more. We also offer off-campus activities as a function for your clubs. These take place within the 35-mile radius and do not include an overnight stay. For instance, we've had groups in the past go on ski trips to Perfect North Slopes, participate in service projects downtown, host day-long retreats at um, venues in Cincinnati, or even attend a local Reds game. These activities still have to be submitted for approval, but they may not require a chaperone unless they are higher risk. So Xavier also has an anti-hazing policy, which was effective as of summer 2022. Ohio passed Collins Law, and this requires all students and advisors to go through a hazing awareness and prevention training. So with this, we have mandated reporting. So if you have knowledge or witness hazing, you must report it to Xavier and law enforcement. With hazing prevention, we hazing is often thought of as, of as extreme actions required of members pledging to join an activity or group where they're subjected to humiliation. Um, hazing is that, but also so much more. Here's a few examples. Um, it could be something as a new member of your club performing unnecessary duties, um, required greeting of members in a specific man manner, required carrying of certain items, 
if you have to ask yourself, why do we have to do this? Or you do ask and someone says because everyone else did it, there might be a pattern of hazing and you should report it. And then we have our end of campus programming policy. So the cutoff of each semester for student events is the Friday before finals week at midnight. Um, after that, campus events can resume once finals have officially ended for the semester. And as you can see, the dates are listed for the fall semester and spring semester. And then with our gambling <laughs> policy, in short, money can't be exchanged for betting or split the pot in cash prizes with a raffle. So basically, don't gamble and students can't receive cash as a prize. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our baseline program. This applies to our clubs on campus, um, and it's our way of keeping track of expectations and making sure that you have an active role on campus. For instance, we expect that you'll be meeting with your members at least once per month for general membership. Um, this is to ensure that you have a recurring time frame set aside to bring your members together. We want this to happen at least three times in the fall and four times in the spring, um, so roughly at the timeline laid out here on the slide. Um, and the club will also have to submit meeting minutes from this, including an agenda and uh, an attendance on EngageXU. We also have an expectation for your advisor as well to meet with them once per month, about seven times per academic year. This is also going to come with a documentation of minutes and a submission form on EngageXU to be sure that you're tracking that throughout the year. Other expectations of the baseline program include the submission of a membership recruitment and retention plan. Each semester, you'll be expected to fill out a brief plan detailing how you expect to recruit and retain members, and be sure to hit on your strategy for things like maybe social media or tabling different events. This is something that you can do throughout the year, but you can do in bullet format if you choose. Um, it doesn't have to be a long essay. It's just meant to show us that you have thought ahead about how to grow your group. And we also expect that you have three events per semester in addition to regular club meetings. These aren't meant to be a burdensome requirement, but they are meant to ensure that you are doing more than just gathering on a recurring basis and instead innovating with new ideas and bringing members together or into the fold. This could be anything from taking members off campus to a Reds game to having an event on campus where you table and promote your club to other groups. Um, these events can take place inside of other series of events like Week of Welcome, or they can be isolated. And feel free to ask us if you need ideas for programs. We also have a service and engagement component to the baseline program. This is to ensure that at least 80% of your club roster participates in one service activity over the course of the year. This is really central to our mission as a Jesuit Catholic institution, and we want to make sure that groups are prioritizing this. Whether it's part of their mission or not, you can find ways to communicate and be part of community service. Um, popular formats for this might include taking part in Community Action Day in the fall during Family Weekend, um, but that's not the only way to exercise your ability to serve our greater community. And finally, we ask that student activity fee usage be no less than 85%. So any budget that you were receiving this year from the Student Government Association must be spent down at least 85% or more. This is so that you can justify asking for the same or more budget next year and avoid recapture of dollars that you go unspent. This is a good target for you to hit, so please be sure to be spending your money throughout the year, and that way it's not all banking up until the last minute and then you don't get approved to spend it all for your final events. We welcome any questions at any time. You can find our emails here at the end. Obviously there's not a chance for you to ask questions in this presentation, so feel free to reach out if you feel like something was unclear or you're not sure um, how to plan your event. Again, please let us know. You can find us anytime at these emails or stop by our office on the second floor of Gallagher in room 210. Thank you.